go ahead and start that recording. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be on mistakes, errors, and corrections. Um, this is not typically a topic we go over in some of our rules education seminars and sessions. Um, there, there's some concepts in here that are, are getting a tiny bit into the weeds, getting a tiny bit, a little bit more towards the advanced end of, of our rules content. But it's an important thing to go over because, as you'll see in the first slide, the kind of the first thing I'll talk about is that None of us are perfect. None of us ever play the game of golf perfect. And more likely than not, there's times where we're going to come across something that we get wrong or something that we screw up or something that we don't apply the correct way. And there's certain mechanisms in the rules of golf that either allow us to make a correction and go back and fix what we got wrong or fix what we didn't do right. And there's certain things in the rules of golf that are going to tell us that we have to go back and make a correction or we have to go back and fix what we did wrong. Or if we don't later on along the line, if we get to a certain point, we might have some other things to deal with in our round of golf based on that error. So uh, again, it's an important topic to kind of go over. Um, and, and I think it's it, some of these things that we, we branch out into a bunch of different rules throughout this presentation. With some of our other presentations, like free relief, penalty relief, that, that we kind of stay around the same, either one or two rules. Um, you'll notice in tonight's presentation, we're going to be jumping around the rule book a lot. So if you're following along at home with your rule book open, or you have something else that you're kind of following along with, whether you have the USJ rules app on your phone, or you actually have your rules of golf book at home cracked open, we're going to be kind of jumping around a lot. So just Keep that in mind if you need to be flipping pages or changing the screen in your app. So we will go ahead and get started. Again, no round of golf is perfect. E even the best of us that play really good golf and we make a ton of pars and a ton of birdies and maybe we play the round of golf with one single golf ball. Sometimes, maybe it's not in that round, but sometime in our golf career at some point, we might make a mistake or an error and we might have to fix it or we might have to just deal with it, might get a penalty and it might not be the perfect round of golf. So no round of golf is perfect, no matter how hard we try. Again, we're all human. And there are some times in the rules that no matter how hard we're trying, we might get it wrong, but the rules might give us some leeway or they might accept our reasonable judgment that we were trying to get it right. We were trying to do the best we could to get something right, even though we might get it wrong. Or we have some scenarios like we have in match play, where even if we might totally get it wrong and we didn't know we got it wrong, the rules are just gonna let us go and act like we got it right. So just keeping that in mind with, with how we're moving forward with the concept of this presentation. When I talk about the difference between an error and a mistake, and again, this is, this is kind of me, Lewis Harry making this up. This isn't really something you'll find in the USJ rules of golf. This is not something you're gonna find um, outside of this presentation, but this is something that I kind of try and keep in my own head, that there is a difference between making an error on the golf course and making a mistake. And when I think of an error on the golf course, I think of it's one, it's a breach of a rule that sometimes is gonna require a correction. And typically a penalty is gonna be attached to that mistake that I, or that error I just made. So it usually follows all of those things. It's usually checking the boxes on all of those things, breaching a rule, sometimes requiring a correction, sometimes maybe not requiring a correction. And usually that penalty is going to be attached to what we just did. When I think of a mistake or making a mistake during the round, I usually think of it being an incorrect procedure or the incorrect application of a rule that might or might not have applied to what we were doing. So with, so with going back to error, breaching that rule, the rules was existing and we did something that went against what the rule says. In this case, with a mistake, the rule's existing and, and we're trying to kind of get it right and we're almost there, but just something wasn't exactly all the way there. And, and again, we'll, we'll see this as we kind of go forward here with with the presentation. 
if there's something for some reason that we did a mistake or we made a mistake with an incorrect procedure or incorrectly applying a rule that didn't apply to us, and then we don't take any actions to correct that mistake, usually at that point, then it becomes an error and then a penalty is going to kick in. So you can kind of see there's a, a slight difference between the two when we talk about an error versus a mistake. So I want to talk about there's I want to talk about errors first. And there, when we talk about errors, these are things that are going to require a correction. And when we're talking about requiring a correction, we could do a lot of different things after we've made this error. But no matter how much we do, we're going to have to go back to that original point and fix something when we're talking about requiring that correction. So there are five actions or errors that are going to require the player to make a correction before making a stroke to start another hole, or if we're talking about the final hole of a round, before turning in that player's scorecard. And you'll see this a lot when we talk about these next five things about before making a stroke to start another hole, or again, for the, for the final hole of the round before turning that scorecard in. What I like to think of those things is I... Everyone's probably heard the term crossing the Rubicon. And if you're not familiar with crossing the Rubicon, it boils down to the point of no return. We've crossed a point and there's no possible way now to go backwards or to go back to where we came from. So I like to think of starting the play of another hole or turning in your scorecard. Those are things in the rules that I consider Rubicons. Once we have done that, we have crossed the Rubicon and we have shut off the door to doing something else, usually making a correction. There's a lot of other Rubicons in the rules that we have. Uh, if we're requesting a ruling in match play, we usually have a Rubicon to request that ruling in match play. It's usually before someone else tees off on the next hole. If we haven't done so before that happens, that Rubicon has been crossed. And if we haven't requested that ruling in match play, we can't go backwards. So you'll see that there's a handful of Rubicons that we're going to cross tonight or that exist in these rules. But if we're going to have a correction that needs to happen, we can't cross that Rubicon yet to make that correction. So all of these things in these next five actions, they're only going to apply to stroke play. The reason why they're only applying to stroke play is because one, they're either carrying the penalty of a general penalty, and in match play, the general penalty is loss of hole. So there's no correction required in match play because the hole is over, someone lost that hole. Or, and you'll see in one of these others, one of these things isn't a requirement of match play. So there isn't really a, a correction needed because it wasn't a requirement of match play to begin with. And those are our five actions on the screen there that require a correction in stroke play before we cross a Rubicon that making a stroke to start the next hole or turning in our scorecard after the final hole of the round. We got to make that correction before we cross that Rubicon. And those are those five things we're going to talk about. You'll see that they cross over a bunch of different rules. So like I said before, we're going to be jumping around to a few different rules here. We're going to go to three, six, 14, and 22 over these next five slides. We'll kind of see a little bit of how each of these things function and how they work. So we'll talk about the first one. The first one is pretty simple. It's just the failure to hole out. Typically, as we all know, if we watched our first virtual rules hour from a few handful of weeks ago with match play versus stroke play, we all know that it is a requirement of individual stroke play to get the ball in the hole every single hole for all those 18 holes or nine holes or whatever that round is. We got to get that ball in the hole. So we got to add up all of those scores so we can compare ourselves to everyone else in the field. Now with other forms of stroke play like Stableford, par bogey, max score, those things aren't necessarily going to require us to hole out. Those rules are modified in a way to where they don't necessarily require hole outs. But with talking about just the regular form of individual stroke play, we need the player to hole out on every single hole. And if we have a failure to hole out on every single hole, the player's got to correct that mistake before, again, we cross that Rubicon of teeing off on the next hole 
or again for the final hold of the round before returning that scorecard. If we don't correct that mistake and then we cross that Rubicon and we don't have a score on that hole because we haven't pulled out, there's no way for that player to compare themselves to every other player in the field by adding up all of those strokes. So the only option for the committee now is to disqualify that player because we don't have, again, we don't have that total stroke comparison because we didn't finish that hole. We had a failure to hole out. So again, if that mistake's not corrected in time, if we cross that Rubicon, the player is going to be disqualified. And when we see our call out to our other forms of stroke play, stable third, max score, or par bogey, where that scoring does function a little bit differently. And if we do have a case where a player fails to hole out in one of those other forms of stroke play, we're not going to disqualify that player. We're just going to do whatever the rules say that we're modifying in those forms of play. And we're going to apply the rules that way. So if we're playing Stableford, and Stableford is a game that works based on we're giving you X amount of points based on what you make on the whole stroke-wise, and that's how we're going to compare you to the rest of the field. Well, in Stableford, there's a point where you just can't earn any points. It might be double bogey. The committee might modify it to be bogey, triple bogey, whatever that committee says that that number is. At some point in Stableford, you just can't make any points. So it's going to be okay if you pick that ball up or if you don't hole out in Stableford. If we have a failure to hole out in Stableford, the player is just not going to get any points. Same thing in maximum score. If, if a player fails to hole out in max score, we're just going to apply that maximum score to whatever it is that the committee says it is to that player's hole. And with par bogey, it's a game where you play it's essentially a stroke play game where you're playing a match against par or bogey. And if you don't hole out, you're just going to lose that hole and you're not going to count. That hole's not going to count as a win for you in that game. So when we have this failure to hole out where we don't have a score and the player is getting disqualified, we're talking about that individual form of stroke play. You'll notice on this, this rule as well that the disqualification is the only penalty is, that is applying here. This isn't a one-stroke penalty rule. This isn't a general penalty rule. This is only a disqualification penalty. It's possible that a player might get other penalties before correcting that mistake. You know, if I'm a player on the green and I haven't marked my ball and I just pick the ball up and move on to the next hole, then I'm going to get a penalty of one stroke if I then replace that ball to go correct my mistake of not holding out because I've moved my ball in play. I picked it up and it wasn't accidental. So I'm getting that penalty for something else. So you'll notice on this, this you'll, as we go forward, other rules that require the correction, they might have the general penalty attached to them or something else attached to them before we get to disqualification. This one is one that it just has that disqualification penalty, but it leaves the door open for other penalties to apply based on how a player does get to the failure to hole out. Jumping a little bit forward to our next one, this is kind of the, when we get into rule six, we're talking about the play of a hole and how we play a hole and the ball we use to play a hole. So now this one is talking about we're starting the play of the hole. We're starting from the, we're supposed to start every hole from the teeing area playing a progression of strokes to the putting green and then holing out on the putting green. So based on having to have that requirement of starting every hole from the teeing area, we need a rule that tells us what happens when we play from outside the teeing area. And again, this one is one where if we're playing match play, this rule applies very differently. If we're playing individual stroke play, it's going to apply another way. And again, there's going to be some penalties attached to it in stroke play. So if we're talking about individual stroke play and we have a player that plays the ball from outside the teeing area, that player is getting the general penalty. So two penalty strokes in stroke play. And again, they must correct that mistake and they got to do it by playing a ball from inside the teeing area. Back to the first part of rule 6-1, it's telling us that you have to start your hole from the teeing area. 
the committee has put those T markers there for a reason. They didn't just put them there for decoration. They have put them there because they want every player in the field to play from the same place or the same area in starting the play of all the holes throughout the round. So we got to correct that mistake by playing a stroke from inside the teeing area. That original ball we played from outside the teeing area, that's not a ball in play. We th There's no way we can make a score with that golf ball. We know we're going to have to make that correction at some point, so that ball is not in play. We have started the play of the hole because the rules tell us that any stroke we make to start the play of the hole, whether it was from inside or outside the teeing area, we have started the play of the hole, so the hole has started for us. But there is a correction required now, and we got to get that ball inside the teeing area and make a stroke from there. So if we were starting a hole and we teed off from outside the teeing area, that stroke's not going to count. Any other strokes we make with that ball aren't going to count until we make the correction. And the general penalty is going to apply. So we're going to get the two strokes. And then whenever we go make that correction of playing from inside the teeing area, we are making our third stroke from there and then going on and playing the hole with our normal progression of strokes. Again, strokes, name or strokes, they're not gonna count. Here we see our Rubicon again. That player does not correct that mistake before making a stroke to begin another hole or for the final hole of the round before returning that scorecard to the committee. We're gonna see another disqualification here with, if we don't correct that mistake. Again, back to that second bullet point, that ball played from outside the teeing area, it's not a ball in play. When we talk about status of the ball and having a ball that is in play versus out of play, you know, what is a substituted ball? When does the substituted ball become the ball in play or a provisional ball? When does that become the ball in play? We can only score or we can only put a score on our scorecard with a ball that is in play. We don't have a valid score for a ball that is not in play. So again, that ball played from outside the teeing area, there is no score we can make with that ball. We need to make that correction, apply that general penalty, and then get a ball in play from the correct area and go on from there. Continuing along with our rule of playing a hole and what ball do we use to play that hole and where do we play that ball from, we see another rule that requires a correction after we've made that error in rule six, and it's simply stroke at a wrong ball. And I'll be the first person to raise my hand, and I'll tell you that I have made a stroke at a wrong ball at some point in my golfing career. I'm sure probably a lot of us on this call tonight have probably made a stroke at a wrong ball at some time in our golf career. Happens all the time from casual general play to the club level, high level competitions like our CGA championships, USGA qualifying, USGA championships, all the way up to the PGA tour level. We even saw a wrong ball this year on the PGA tour earlier in January at this at Kapalua, Justin Rose hit a wrong ball on one of his, his holes. He was playing, forget who he was playing with, but it seemed like it was a blind landing area. At some point they got the ball switched. He didn't check to see, or he didn't identify his ball before he made a stroke at it made a stroke at that ball, turns out it was a wrong ball. So it doesn't necessarily matter if you're a beginner, an intermediate player, or someone who plays golf for a living, it's possible that at some point you might make a stroke at a wrong ball. And the rule simply tells us that you can't make a stroke at a wrong ball. You, you need to make sure that the ball you are playing is your ball. Again, it goes back to my whole thing about playing a golf hole is like a chain with a progression of strokes. And when you play a wrong ball, that chain is broken. You have played the wrong ball, you've got off of your chain, and now we need to do something to reconnect that chain and get back on track of what you were doing before you played that wrong ball. So we can't make a stroke at a wrong ball. If we do, thankfully the stroke we make at that wrong ball doesn't count. It's not gonna be a stroke that counts in our score. And we got to correct that mistake under the rules by playing the right ball from its original spot, or we got to, for some reason, take relief to get another ball into play that is our ball. 
Playing that wrong ball comes the penalty of the general penalty. So again, this doesn't require correction in match play because as soon as you play the wrong ball in match play, the hole's over. You lost. You lost the hole. Move on. Go to the next hole. No correction required. But in stroke play, the stroke's not going to count, but we are going to apply that two-stroke penalty to our score and then go make that correction by playing the right ball. If for some reason we play a wrong ball and we continue with it, all those strokes we're making with the wrong ball are also not going to count. There's still a wrong ball. A wrong ball is not in play for us. So again, a ball that is not in play can't count for our score. So none of those strokes are going to account for when we're playing a wrong ball, whether it's one stroke or whether it's five strokes. They're all going to go away. The general penalty is still going to apply because that applies to our score no matter what. But we got to make that correction by playing the right ball from somewhere, whether that's going back and searching for three minutes for the ball we should have hit. And then if we can't find that ball by searching for it, taking another penalty stroke under stroke and distance, going back to where we last made a stroke of the ball. However, we need to get a ball back into play or play that right ball, our ball that was in play, we need to make that correction. We do have one exception to this rule, and this is kind of a weird exception, and it's an exception not a lot of people will ever apply to their situation, not a lot of people will ever come across, but we have an exception for a ball moving in water, whether that's temporary water or water in a penalty area, that if we make a stroke at a wrong ball that was moving in water, there's going to be no penalty. However, we're still going to be required to go play the right ball. We still need to go get back on that chain of events, rejoin our chain, and go play the right ball from somewhere. But if that ball was moving in water for some reason, again, whether it's temporary water or in a penalty area, no penalty for making a stroke at that wrong ball moving in water. I don't necessarily know if this audio is going to work, but we have a video here to show. The video kind of talks a little bit about some wrong ball stuff. For anyone that doesn't know this video or hasn't seen this video ever before, it's happened in the 2014 United States Open at Pinehurst. Uh, this was a situation with Hunter Mahan and Jamie Donaldson. I believe this was on 9 or 18. It was somewhere before they made their turn to go back to the other side. Um, but they both each hit each other's balls as a wrong ball. Uh, the video talks a little bit about, you know, Hunter Mahan thought he hit his drive down the left side. Jamie Donaldson thought he hit his drive down the right side. For some reason, the balls were on opposite sides of the fairway from where they thought those balls should have been. Again, neither player identified that golf ball before they hit it. They both hit those golf balls, got up to the green, discovered that they had both hit a wrong ball, and then started their procedure to go back and correct that mistake.
So again, back to, and I know the audio kind of gets lost a little bit. I think it has something to do with us recording the Zoom. So if anyone didn't hear that, I think it has something to do with the recording of the Zoom. But to kind of summarize that whole video, the whole chat through that whole thing was talking about, you know, Thomas Pagel is talking about, you know, there. this is a rule that requires a correction. You know, Jamie Donaldson and Hunter Mann, they have to go back. They discovered this up on the putting green. They're going backwards to where those shot, those where they hit that wrong ball had occurred. Both Hunter Mahan and Jamie Donaldson, in correcting this mistake, they're going to have to replace a golf ball wherever that stroke was made from or wherever their ball previously was at. They're replacing a golf ball there and then making that stroke from there. Because in, if you take the wrong ball part out of it, what had happened to their original ball is it was moved by an outside influence. Whether it was played as a wrong ball by another player is a different story. But the basis of their ball was it was played by an outside influence. So getting a ball back in play for them is just going to require them just to replace the ball back to where it was previously. And with both of them playing the wrong ball, both of them should have a pretty good idea of where they played those wrong balls from and have a pretty good idea of where they need to replace their own ball back to proceed forward in correcting this mistake. The end of that video just talks about, I think Paul Azinger asked a question about, well, what happened if they would have holed out and then walked over to number one T making the turn? Again, Thomas Pagel just makes that, um, uh, kind of wraps it up there with saying, you know, they would have been okay with holding out. That turning point or that that trigger point there, I think is the term he used in the video, is when they tee off on the next hole. So again, we see that same Rubicon of making a stroke to start the next hole as kind of our our window or our threshold to get to that disqualification penalty if they did not correct that mistake. So uh, kind of a long, long summary there of, of wrong ball. The other thing that we see with an error that we see has the word wrong in it. Again, we have two wrongs. We, have, we saw a wrong ball. Now we see wrong place. Both of those things having a definition on the rules of golf. But now we're jumping over to rule 14 of playing from wrong place. And now we see that we have something also attached to it that says serious breach. And with playing from a wrong place, this could go two different ways. We have kind of a fork in the road, but I like to call it with serious breach. It's possible that we might play from a wrong place, but we don't have a serious breach. Or we might take the other path where we do go down a serious breach situation. And with having a serious breach with wrong place, that's when we're going to get into the requiring the correction of this mistake. The non-serious breach, we're probably just going to let you go on and move forward with the penalty and then let you go about your day. The serious breach part of this, well, we may need to back up here. So just like with the wrong ball, we can't play wrong ball. In this rule, it's going to tell us we can't play our ball from the wrong place. If we play our ball from the wrong place, we're going to get a general penalty. We're going to get that general penalty, whether it was serious breach or non-serious breach. So either way, this general penalty is going to stand here. And again, this whole deal in match play, if we play from the wrong place in match play, hole's over because we lost the hole, we're going to move on, whether it was a serious breach or not. But in stroke play, we're going to get the general penalty. And then we need to figure out what do we do from here? If it was a serious breach, we got to correct that mistake by playing out the hole with the ball played from the right place under the rules. And a lot of the times with wrong place, serious breach, the majority of how this is going to happen is someone's usually going to be taking relief and they're either going to be taking relief in the wrong spot 
or they're going to be dropping outside the relief area to get to a wrong place. Outside the relief area, probably not a serious breach because it's going to be close enough to where they should have been dropping. Taking relief in a wrong place, like on the other side of a pond or a bunch of different club lengths away or way, way off the line for back on the line relief, that could possibly get into the scenario of serious breach. And if we don't correct this mistake of playing from wrong place to the serious breach, we see our Rubicon again. If the player is uncertain about whether the breach is serious or not, we have a scenario here where a player can play out a hole with two balls. They can play out a hole with the ball they don't know if it's a serious breach or not. And then they can play a hole, the ball out that maybe is on the more conservative side of where they should have dropped or where they should have played a ball from and see where the committee can decide of what they need to do from there. Anytime we're trying to correct this mistake of having a serious breach of playing from the wrong place, we got to report it to the committee. Just like playing a second ball with doubt as to procedure under Rule 20.1c3, we got to report this to the committee that we tried to correct this mistake of playing from the wrong place. Got to report those facts before we return our scorecard. And it's going to apply whether we played out the hole with only that ball or we completed it with two balls, even if we played with the same uh, the same score with both balls. If we don't report those facts to the committee, we're going to get to that disqualification penalty. When we get to that point of trying to determine whether it's a serious breach, and I kind of glossed over the definition of serious breach with wrong place, we get to that serious breach point when we're considering that where the ball should have been, the distance from where it probably should have been dropped, all of the conditions affecting the stroke, the lie, all that stuff, the difficulty of the shots, all of those things kind of factor into whether it was a serious breach or not. So if we get to that point where we think it's a serious breach and we have now played a second golf ball to try and correct that mistake, and we have now reported to the committee that we have played a second golf ball and trying to correct our mistake of playing from the wrong place. Now we're going to get to the point where the committee is going to decide the player's score for the hole. If the score with the ball that was played to correct that mistake of playing from the wrong place, if that's going to be the score that counts, the committee is going to decide that, hey, you did the right thing and we you got that ball corrected by playing from the right place, you're just going to be stuck with one general penalty, just the original general penalty you got from playing from the wrong place. The stroke made in playing that other ball from the wrong place and any more strokes at that, we're just gonna throw them out. That ball is not gonna count. We already know which ball is gonna count here. If we play that second golf ball and we try to correct that mistake of playing from the wrong place, the serious breach, but by playing that second golf ball, we also got it in a wrong place. So now we have two wrong places we're dealing with. If the committee decides that we got that second golf ball and trying to correct the mistake in a wrong place, but it wasn't necessarily a serious breach, we almost got it right. We were close enough to getting it right, but we were still in the wrong place. We're gonna get another general penalty. Because we're gonna get the general penalty of playing that original ball from the wrong, that with a serious breach from the wrong place. But unfortunately, we got to get you another general penalty for playing from the wrong place twice. Even though we almost got it right, we're still going to have to give you another one for trying to correct it and still getting it wrong. So we're getting that total of four penalty strokes, adding to that ball, and then adding up our score from there. If for some reason that we have played from the wrong place with a serious breach, and we try to correct it by playing a second golf ball. And that second golf ball we played was also from a wrong place with another serious breach. The committee is just going to decide, hey, we can't. There's nothing we can do for you here. We're going to have to disqualify you because you tried twice. You never got the ball in the right place to begin with. And both of these things were so egregious that we just can't score you here. The only choice left is to disqualify you. Last error that requires our correction, going to take place in foursomes and threesomes, so a form of play where we are alternating strokes with a partner. And the basis of alternate shot or foursomes is that we got to make alternating strokes with our partner. 
And if we don't make alternating strokes, if we play twice in a row, or if we play when it's not our turn to make a stroke, that's going to be an error, and we're going to have to do something with it. So on each hole, we got to make those strokes alternating between partners on the side. If for some reason we make a stroke in the wrong order, we're going to get a general penalty. So again, if this is four sums match play or three sums match play, we just lost the hole. We're going to move on. But if it's for some stroke play or three some stroke play, we're going to apply the general penalty. And we got to correct that mistake by getting the right partner, whoever was supposed to be making that stroke. We got to get them to make that stroke. We got to get a ball back and replace the ball. We got to get them to make that stroke. Stroke made in the wrong order, just like with the wrong ball. And any more strokes before we correct that mistake, we're going to throw those away because the right partner didn't do it. The wrong partner made the strokes. We're just going to discard those. We're going to get them out of there. We got to correct that mistake. Again, we see the same Rubicon that we've been seeing for the last three uh, rules. We got to correct that mistake before making a stroke to begin another hole or before returning our scorecard for the last hole of the round. Without making that correction, see the same penalty we've seen for the last four or so rules, we're going to get the side disqualified. I kind of already gave the answer to this question away, so we'll just breeze through this one real quick. It talks about a player lying on the putting green. They never marked their golf ball, waiting for their fellow competitors to putt out. Maybe they're the last person to go. They lift their golf ball without marking it, and they're just walking over to the next hole with their other two players because they're not paying attention. Before teeing off on that next hole, they realize they never hold out on the previous hole and they never marked their golf ball and they did pick it up. So they got to go back and correct that mistake. They place their ball back down where it was and then hole out. And it talks about what penalty did we get? And I, again, when we were talking about the failure to hole out, I kind of already gave the answer away. They're getting the one penalty stroke in that case because one, we had the failure to hole out and we had to correct that mistake. So we knew we had that. But we also had the error or the mistake of lifting our golf ball without marking it and moving our golf ball. So we have that mistake as well. So we have the one penalty stroke there. Went back, corrected the mistake. We were all good there. Before we move on to the last handful of slides here, is there any, we have any questions about those five must corrects and stroke play? Or George, anything in the chat? Nothing in the chat right now. Okay, sounds good. We can, uh, we can keep moving on and like I said, we'll probably finish finish maybe five, 10 minutes early and then we can leave some time to address some questions uh, right as we finish up. So we'll keep moving on. We're gonna shift gears from errors. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about mistakes. And again, all of these things with mistakes are just either incorrectly applying a rule or getting some part of a procedure as part of a rule wrong, maybe dropping wrong, dropping in a wrong place, doing all those things that are correctable before a penalty kicks in. So we're talking about first about correcting a mistake, either substituting a golf ball, replacing a golf ball, dropping, replacing the ball, anything with what I call our ball procedures, rule 14 issues. We're going to try and see if we can get some mistakes here and how do we correct those mistakes. And so if we have any mistakes made with any of our ball procedures in Anytime we get the ball in our hand and then are dropping it or doing something else with it, we're going to have the opportunity to lift that ball and then correct the mistake before we make a stroke at it. This is another Rubicon we're seeing here that making a stroke of that ball, that's the Rubicon to correct these mistakes. Once we've made the stroke at that golf ball, after we've got either a procedure wrong or applied a rule wrong, that's the Rubicon has been crossed, then another penalty might kick in and we lose the opportunity to correct our mistake. When for some reason we substitute another ball for the original ball when not allowed under the rules, so maybe we're on the putting green, we mark and lift our ball, put it in our pocket, and then dig another ball out of another pocket and put that ball down, so we've incorrectly substituted a golf ball when not allowed. We're going to be allowed to lift that ball we just substituted in incorrectly without penalty. 
and correct that mistake by putting the right ball back down where it should be. And we're going to be able to avoid the penalty before making a stroke at it. Again, it's only allowed before the ball is played. We haven't crossed that Rubicon yet of making the stroke. So we still have the opportunity to fix what we just got wrong. This is kind of the heart of this correcting mistakes portion of it. Uh, you can find the majority of all this in rule 14.5. Uh, rule 14.5, we sometimes call the eraser rule because all these procedures we're using to correct these mistakes, it's kind of like we just took a little bit of an eraser on that pencil and just erased all those things we got wrong before we made the stroke. And now we're doing the right thing and correcting all these mistakes. So uh, the, the heart of this involves whether we can change to a different rule or a different relief option, or maybe change a wrong drop we made or maybe we didn't meet all the requirements of 14.3 with our dropping requirements. We're gonna see some procedures here of our eraser rule that before we make that stroke, here's some things of how we can fix, here's some things we can change, or maybe we can go to a different rule completely. So anytime we're correcting a stake in taking relief, so dropping, placing, and replacing all those ball procedures, whether we're going to have to use the same rule or same relief option or a different rule, or we have the opportunity to change to a different rule or change to a different relief option, it's going to depend on the nature of the mistake or what happened or what the mistake exactly was. And I want to preface this by saying that anytime that we're changing to a different rule or changing to a different relief option or changing where we might be dropping that golf ball, before we make those corrections, we're going to be stuck with what we get right. So if we got right, the rule we're using, if the rule applied to our situation, we got that right, we're going to be stuck with that rule. If we got a bunch of different things right, we're going to be stuck with all of those different things. We might just have to change this one little thing at the end. Or if we got nothing right to begin with, then we might be able to go all the way back to the beginning with our eraser rule and just completely start over and correct our mistake from the beginning. So we'll see here, we have a few different flow charts we'll go through in each of those things. So if we put a ball into play under a rule that didn't apply, or if we put a ball into play that are for with a rule that did apply, but we dropped or placed it in the wrong place, or we put a ball into play with a rule that applied, was dropped or placed in the right place, but we just have to maybe drop it again because it rolled somewhere outside the relief area or it did something else that requires a redrop. So there's three different things there that he shows the levels of the things we got right and the things we we're kind of sticking with. So if we put a ball into play under a rule that didn't apply to our situation at all, we didn't get anything right to begin with because the primary starting point here was what rule are we using? And we didn't get that right to begin with. So if we didn't get the rule right, nothing going forward is gonna be right. So this is kind of starting all the way back to the beginning. If we're going back to correct that mistake, we can use any rule that's gonna to apply to our situation. So if we are starting our flow chart, let's pretend our ball is in a penalty area and we're gonna go forward with proceeding with our golf ball. If we lift our golf ball to proceed under rule 19, which is unplayable ball, and we know that we can't use the unplayable ball rule in a penalty area. So again, we, we're using a rule that's not applying to our situation here. And then we drop that golf ball for some reason. Maybe we went two club lengths away from the ball, but dropped in the penalty area, whatever we might've done. And then we realize, or maybe we're alerted or another player tells us, hey, I don't think you can use a unplayable in a penalty area. Or, hey, you need to use a different rule. You can't take an unplayable there. So now we know that that rule is not applying to our situation. Now we can just erase everything. We can pick that ball up with no penalty, erase everything we just did, and then go on to use a rule that does apply to our situation. So rule 17 penalty area, then we can go and use any of those options with rule 17.
if we put a ball into play with a rule that did apply to our situation, so we got that part right, we got the, the first stepping stone right, but then we're going to drop it or place it in a wrong place. We got to go on to use that same rule because we got that right. So we got to stick with that. But because we dropped it in a wrong place or placed it in a wrong place, we still have the option to change to any other relief option under that rule that applies to our situation. So we'll we'll see the same flow chart here. We'll kind of go through it step by step. So we have our ball back in that penalty area. We're deciding to proceed under back on the line relief. So we know we're, we're going to go back on the line here. And this is some, I got to update this, and this is some old stuff from before 2023. But for this, let's just pretend that we dropped off the line in this case. And we know with 2023 going forward with back on the line, we have to drop on the line. So if we drop off of the line, we dropped in a wrong place. We never dropped it in the right place to begin with. And then we realize that we've made that mistake. We can change to any other option under that penalty area rule with correcting that mistake to try and avoid playing from the wrong place. So with changing to any other option, we can now pick up that ball, go back under stroke and distance, go back and go maybe use that lateral relief option if it's a red penalty area. We can change to any other relief option at that point because we got the rule right. We just didn't really get the relief option right. So that's the that's what we're being able to change in this scenario here. We saw this same scenario happen to Rory McIlroy at Pebble Beach when he was taken back on the line of relief. Granted, he was doing it for an unplayable ball, not a penalty area, but he did drop off of the line, dropped in a wrong place. So in Rory McIlroy's case, if he had realized his mistake before he made the stroke at the ball, before he crossed his Rubicon, he could have picked that ball up and either proceeded with the same relief option back on the line and just chosen a different spot on the line. Or he could have now gone back under stroke and distance or used the lateral relief option if he wanted to, because he got the relief rule right. He didn't get the relief option right. So that was kind of what he was able to change there. He didn't. He went on to play from the wrong place, unfortunately. But this was kind of that same thing where Rory could have used this rule picked that ball up and corrected this mistake before making the stroke. So now we're going to talk about getting pretty much mostly everything right. Just very, very at the end, we're going to have to try and do something over again. So we're going to put a ball into play under a rule that did apply, dropped or placed in the right place, but maybe the rule is just going to require us to do a redrop or drop it over again. If we did all that, we got to go on to use the same rule and the same relief option. Again, we were pretty much stuck with everything we got right, which was pretty much everything up until the end where we needed to redrop it. So we got to go use the same rule, same relief option here. See our last flow chart here, ball in the penalty area. We're going to decide to proceed under lateral relief. Player is going to drop that ball in the correct relief area. They're going to drop it from knee height but the ball is just going to roll slightly outside the relief area. So we got the rule right. We got the relief option right. We dropped the ball from the right spot. We dropped the ball in the relief area. So we're meeting all these requirements of a good drop. But since the ball rolled outside the relief area, the rules are just going to tell you, hey, drop again. You got everything else right, just drop again. And in this case, we got to continue on with our lateral relief option from that penalty area and do our redrop. Anytime that we're correcting those mistakes, again, there's no penalty for that ball lifted when we're trying to correct those mistakes of either changing to a different rule, changing to a different relief option, changing where we're dropping on that line, potentially. No penalties for lifting that ball to correct that mistake. Again, player action does not count. Anytime we're working with that ball under that eraser rule, Anything that's happening before we make that stroke, before we're lifting it. Even if we're accidentally causing it to move while we're trying to apply this eraser rule, we're not going to apply any penalties here because we're trying to make a correction. We're trying to do something under the rules. 
If for some reason, though, we breached another rule that would have caught or would have applied to a ball that was correctly put into play, or maybe it was applying to something that applies to our conditions affecting the stroke for a ball now put into play, that penalty is still going to apply whether we correct the mistake of our ball procedure or not. Uh, I know that's kind of a complicated thing to kind of wrap around your head, but if for some reason that we were trying to correct dropping in the wrong place, and while we were doing that, we affected our area of intended stance by stamp, stomping down on the ground a lot. And even though that, can, that area of intended stance was for the ball we were trying to correct, that still might apply to the future ball we're putting in play. So by improving that area of intended stance while we're trying to correct this mistake, that penalty, that, all this is saying is that penalty is still going to apply because it could apply to a future at, or it could apply to that ball that could be put into play correctly. Did pretty good on time tonight. We're just shy of 7 p.m., about seven minutes early. Uh, let's open it up to any questions. So, Lewis, we did have one question in the chat from Don. He was asking basically a scenario where um, a player uh, picks up his ball in the passing green, marks and lifts it. He then replaces it with the wrong ball, puts the ball, realizes, realizes that he plays the wrong ball, to, and goes back and replaces the correct ball and puts it again. Um, he's basically asking how that scenario would play out um and um basically if you can clarify that for him. Yeah, sorry, I'm just I'm reading in the chat, just making sure I'm getting all, all the facts yeah. correct here, making sure we're we're getting it all straight. So uh player A marks the ball, puts it in their pocket, then takes out another ball and then replaces that ball down in the putter and plays that ball. So with with the the second ball they put down on the putting green, it's not necessarily a wrong ball. That would be the ball in play because they've now put it down on the putting green and replaced it or placed it down with the intent for it to be in play. So that becomes the ball in play. It is, however, an incorrectly substituted ball in that case because we weren't when we were marking and lifting our original ball, we were required to put the original ball back down and we didn't do so. So we've now incorrectly substituted a golf ball in that case. And in that case, we've made a stroke of that incorrectly substituted golf ball. So we get a penalty stroke for making a stroke of that incorrectly substituted golf ball. By trying to correct that, that's not necessarily, that's not a thing we need to correct. So by trying to correct it, we are now playing from the wrong place in trying to correct that mistake. The, the fact that we have already seen that putt or how it breaks, or we've already made that stroke once, it's kind of that, that piece of this puzzle is a little bit irrelevant in this scenario. Um, the fact that we tried to correct that mistake of the incorrectly substituted ball, which didn't need to be corrected to begin with, that's where we're now going to get the penalty of a wrong place penalty. And that's going to be a general penalty. And if we didn't have any knowledge of a breach in between those two actions, we're just going to wrap all this up into the one general penalty of playing from the wrong place apply those two strokes and stroke play and then go from there. So I don't, does that whole, I know that was kind of a lot to kind of juggle there. Does that kind of answer your question or does that kind of all fall in order and make sense for you? Okay. Anything else there, George? Yeah, we just had a follow-up from Hillary and she basically asked, what if no stroke was made and the error was caught before that putt? So if we marked and lifted the original ball, put it in our pocket, then went down to replace the incorrectly substituted golf ball, and then before we made the stroke of that incorrectly substituted golf ball, 
realized that that was you know oh shoot sorry i put the wrong ball down i don't think i you know maybe i made a mistake here if we catch that before we make that stroke so again we see another rubicon here making that stroke the incorrectly substituted ball is the rubicon in this scenario if we catch it before we cross that rubicon we can simply again pick that incorrectly substituted ball up and replace our original ball back down with no penalty and then make our stroke at our original ball we were supposed to make the stroke at. Okay. Ooh, that was a, so I know there's a lot to sink in there on that topic with mistakes and errors and all of those different rules were kind of jumping around and all of those penalties and then we're adding in that concept of the Rubicon of, of where we can't go past until we make that correction. So there's a lot to sink in there. So um, if, if nothing, if there was something that didn't quite sink in tonight, maybe go back when we, when we upload this. Hopefully the, the recording will be uploaded possibly by the end of the week, but um, go back, rewatch it, see if something else sinks in. But if there's something with some of those errors or some of those things that require corrections, or maybe even in the last part where we're talking about the eraser rule about changing relief options. If something didn't quite sink in or make sense there, shoot us an email. Be happy to, to kind of walk you through it or, or to try and uh, further break it down to get that concept to sink in. But um, George, if there's nothing else, I think we might wrap it up and it's probably dinner time for most of us. Great. I